you guys welcome back to my channel for another episode of porn star confessions today i'm super excited i have archer croft so welcome archer hi thank you for having me so first and foremost i thought archer croft was fucking like 28 years old how old are you i'll be 42 in a couple months bullshit dude <laughs> i literally look 20 years older than you <laughs> i mean as I was telling you off camera, I guess a, a good dermatologist is worth his weight in gold. And I guess genetics, I got to take after my mom, not my dad. <laughs> That's all. I have a younger, my siblings and I are all four years apart. And my younger sister, who's four years younger than me, looks easily 10 years older than me. But she takes after my dad's side of the family. So I'm like, mm, sucks for you. <laughs> Jesus, dude. Okay, I just got to ask before we start, like, are your teeth veneers? So I get asked this a lot and, and I know that people are going to be like bullshit, but I swear on whatever book you want me to put my hand on. I have never had dental work in my life except for cleanings. The only dental work I've ever had done is when I was in the Marine Corps, I had my wisdom teeth removed. Um, I get cleanings three times a year and I'm very anal about my teeth. I've never had braces. I've never had a cavity. I'm, I'll be 42 in August and never had a cavity. I literally had this conversation with a friend of mine who's a dentist this past weekend. He's like, we hate you kind of people because <laughs> you make no money off of me. But no, I've never even, I've never done anything with my, teeth. I get asked all the time. And if you're in person, I have a very slight like a lap right here. And that's my, I guess my only proof that my teeth are more authentic because I would imagine I would have had that fixed <laughs> if they weren't. <laughs> but no, I've never had any dental work. Thank God. And genetics is my great grandmother didn't lose a, her first tooth from what I understand. So she was like late eighties, early nineties. Oh, damn. So, but sure. she was okay. also well, not taller. <laughs> it's cool. Just summarize with you won the genetic lottery. I mean, I, I'll go on. I'll, I'll, I'll be on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it takes some upkeep. I mean, shit doesn't just happen. I got to get up at five every day and make shit happen. Okay. All right. That's going to lead to another question later on. Yeah. So how did you get started in this business? So, um, throughout the years I've been asked by different people like, Shishi LaRue, I, I had met in person and things like that. Like, oh, you should do it. You should do it. And um, I had a really, really bad, I guess I would say, first interaction with a porn star. Um, I hate to sound like a cunt, but he may not be alive anymore. But I'm just saying he was super rude to me, very mean. And I thought, if that's what this business is about, I want no part of it. So that was probably I was I think I was around 28 when that happened. Um, and I thought, eh, I'm not, I, I'm not interested in this type of dynamic. And so many years passed, life tribulations, all those kind of things. And I was older, more settled and confident in who I am. And when the idea was presented to me again, via, um, doing, um, fans page stuff, um, I thought, uh, I'm not sure. Is this for me? So specifically, and I actually looked this up because I had a feeling you would ask this question and I'm, I wanted to be um, accurate with my dates. Um, I asked my husband today, I was like, what was, he keeps copious records. So I was like, what was the date that I started doing porn? He's like, it was late November, 2018. So that's when it first started. So not too, too distant, but you know, almost five years this year. And um, two of my very, very close friends outside of porn prior to porn, um, RC, Ryan Carter and Digger, who live out in L.A., we were uh, my husband and I were going to see them to hang out with them in Palm Springs. And we were renting this beautiful house with a casita. And there was quite a few other like. Porn people, you know, it was kind of at the the influx of like fans pages and stuff like that. And they're like, so I just want to give you a heads up. We're going to be filming stuff. And I didn't even know what they were talking about. I was like, what are, what are you filming You know, with this? And they're like, well, you know, there's this saying and we're going to be doing some fans pages. And um, if you're interested, you could join in. And I had a lot of trepidation because I was like, uh, I don't know if that's something I want to deal with. And they're like, well, you know what? No pressure. Just think about it. So prior to going to Palm Springs, we met them in LA to drive together. And they were, you know, talking it up and saying, oh, we think you'd be great. It'd be fun. You know, if you don't like it, you know, we'll just do one thing. If you really don't like it, we don't even have to release it. 
And I thought, oh God, I need a porn name. You know, I'm not going to use my own name. And so why <laughs> people ask me like where I get Archer Croft, Archer Croft from, and it's actually really kind of stupid, but funny at the same time. Um, for some reason, I felt this incessant need to have the same initials as my real name. And we were walking from dinner one night in West Hollywood and we passed over the street called Croft Avenue. And I was like, oh, I kind of like that. And so then we started spitballing. And I think that um, RC had said something like um, some weird, like super old timey name for the A aspect. And I was like, what am I, a fucking accountant? And so we just started spitballing. And I don't even honestly know where Archer came from, but it was said. And I was like, that's it. So I thought, all right, well, I mean, I guess I have a name. So I guess we'll move forward. So my very first kind of uh, intro into it was in Palm Springs in late November of 2018 with uh, RC Digger at a rented guest house. <laughs> and uh, it went over really well. That weekend actually was very fortuitous for me because the other gentlemen involved were people that had like super big followings. Like I didn't, I'm not a big social media person in my real life. I could give two fucks about that. I, I live my life. I, I you don't even know what I had for fucking lunch. Um, and so I don't put a lot of shit on social media because I'm literally out there living my life. And so I was like, Oh God, I have to get this and I have to get this and I've done with this. And it was, it was a little overwhelming to be honest. And so the guys that were also there, um, I mean, I guess it's okay to say names. I mean, they know they were there. Um, people like Jack Mack and Roth and um, now uh, Silver Steel and a few other people. And so they had massive followings. And so it literally took off like a rocket ship. Like it shocked me how quick I was like, oh, fuck, this is, this is happening now. <laughs> so yeah, uh, no late November of 2018, Palm Springs, RC, Digger, Jack Mack and Roth, Silver Steel. It was... Uh, Looking back, it was kind of kind of a magical experience. I would have never expected the trajectory of what happened thereafter. Okay. So, like, obviously, your first interaction with the porn star was very negative. Right. What is your impression of porn stars now? I would... <laughs> I think the simple answer to that is people are people regardless. So there's going to be people that I interact with that I get along with. And there's people that I don't, there's people that like me and that don't, you know, one of my favorite sayings of all time is peaches are sweet, but not everybody likes peaches. So we all have our different interactions with people. Um, I think that we are quick sometimes to judge people based off of personality traits that remind us of somebody else. So if it's positive, it most likely will be a positive interaction. And conversely, a negative one will produce such as that. And um, I guess because I'm aware of that, I kind of take things at face value and I try to really not take things personally because you're not really reflecting negatively on me. I mean, maybe you do hate me. I don't know. I, I mean, to me, it's irrelevant either way, but you might be transferring your own baggage onto me and that's okay. You know, that just shows, you know, maybe I need to be more compassionate and you need some time for healing. I don't, I don't know. So, um, as it pertains to the majority of people that I've interacted with, with porn, I've had pretty phenomenal experiences. Um, the one thing that always caught me off guard is I'm a very personal person. I'm very interactive and I mean, not asking everybody to be my best friend, but I always find it interesting. I'll meet somebody and we'll do a scene or whatever, and we're having a great time and interacting well. And then I never hear from them again. And I find that super comical because I'm not asking to like touch base daily. I mean, we're all busy and I really wouldn't have time for that myself, but I don't know. It's like almost like we existed on the same plane for a moment and then poof, never to be seen again. And I find that kind of comical, but at the same time, it's like, oh, it's business. You're meeting other people. I'm meeting other people. It is what it is. I don't really take any deep worry into it, I guess I would say. Yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a good point though, because like, I, I feel like there's a difference because, you know, at least for me personally, one of the best parts of getting older <laughs> is your ability to see through bullshit faster, mm -hmm. or you can see it coming a mile away. You know, you see someone start exuding certain personality traits. And you're like, Oh, I've seen this movie before. I know exactly how this shit ends. All right. And 
like I feel like there's a difference though between that versus like someone who will date like a Hispanic guy and they have a bad experience. So then they just write off all Hispanic men. You know what I mean? Mm. There's a big difference between those two things. I mean, yeah, I, I think that we have experiences that teach us lessons that put up our red flags. Like I'm going to maybe see where this goes, but I'm going to be conscientious and cautious of, you know, not opening myself up too much. Um, I personally try to let every experience be its own individual because you never know what the opportunity is going to present itself. So if I am immediately putting up my own roadblocks about past experiences, I might miss out on an experience with somebody who's pretty fucking phenomenal. And I did that a lot in my twenties, like who I am now in my forties is so vastly different than I was in my twenties that I've had enough life experience to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to give somebody enough rope to hang themselves. But when you show me who you are, believe them. And that's kind of the, the, the mindset that I take is like, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt initially. And if you prove yourself to be untrustworthy or, you know, whatever negative connotation, I'm just going to release that with love and say, you know what? I don't know that we're a match. That doesn't make you a wrong or bad person. That just makes you somebody that's not necessarily compatible with the morals and character traits that I hold dear. And that's fine. You know, go enjoy your life and live it. It just won't leave with me in it. (laughs) No, I like that. I think that's that's actually a really good um, way to look at it and a really good way to handle things. Um, So you had said that you were a Marine. Yes. How long were you a Marine for? I was in for uh, right around four years. Um, So when I was in high school, um, well, let me preface this by saying both my grandfathers were Marines. That's incidentally how my parents met in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And when I was in high school, I was in a lot of Excel programs. So when I graduated high school, I already had two years of college under my belt. And um, I had done like dual enrollment programs and things like that. So with all of the college acceptance letters, I thought I kind of wanted something a little different. I've always been on the smaller side. I'm five foot four. And at that time when I was in high school, I was, I don't know, 115 maybe ish. And I was always bullied for being gay and bullied for this, that, and the other. And it took me until probably about my senior year to stand up for myself. And when I did, it all stopped, which was a pretty amazing situation. But I thought, you know what? I want to try something different. And it was, I'm not a, I, I'm not a stupid person by any stretch of the imagination, but I do feel very naive with what I'm about to say, because I was at a concert, an outdoor venue concert here where I live locally, a little North of here now. And it was like this out, outdoor, like alternative music festival in the nineties. And so it had like, you know, all these different like venues and shit. And one of which was military people. And I didn't realize that they were there recruiting. Didn't even occur to me. I know that sounds stupid, but it was not even something that crossed my mind. I was probably. I would. To be (laughs) fair, I would not expect them to be recruiting in a music festival, but. I mean, okay, so now I don't feel so bad. (laughs) But so the thing was, I was with friends and there, and like, um, I remember the Marine Corps booth specifically was like, if you do 20 pull-ups, we'll give you this Marine Corps shirt. And my thought process was like, Oh, my grandfather will be so proud. It'll be so cool. It says USMC. So I did it. Honestly, I'm so surprised that I was able to do 20 pull-ups when I was like 17 years old because I was scrawny as fuck. But, you know, I did it. I got my t-shirt. Well, guess who was called constantly for recruiter's assistance? This fucking stupid kid. And so um, I got I got sucked in. I got, you know, you know, oh, you would be great. You know, you're what we're looking for. You know, all the bullshit they, they say. But in all honesty, I wanted something different. I wanted I, I didn't want to go directly to college, even though I had scholarships lined up and I had different college acceptances and things like that. I thought, let me try something out of what my normal trajectory was going to be. Because initially when I was in school, I was slated to go in the direction of med- in, in the medical field. So I thought, well, let me do this. It was completely met with, 
you're not doing that for my, my parents, specifically my mother. And so it took a while and I finally broke her down and she was, cause I was only 17 when I graduated. So she had to sign for me to enter. And so I finally broke, I remember her saying specifically, she goes, if a recruiter comes to my house, I'm going to shoot him. And I was like, I'm pretty sure you need a gun to do that, which I don't believe you have. Secondly, I don't know that you'll throw your life away just for that reason. <clears throat> Either way, she met with him. And the fall, actually one week after I turned 18, I joined the Marine Corps. And um, I'm not going to say it was the best experience in my life, but it, it certainly wasn't the worst. Um, I was always a very regimented person. And so I say that because a lot of people are like, oh, it must have taught you routine and regimen and all that. I was always a very like, I'm on top of my shit person. I, I grew up with, um, God, if my mom sees this, which maybe she will, she'll be very upset that I say this, but... I was a very independent child because I had to be, especially from a young age. My mother and father were wonderful people, but there were things growing up where if I didn't take charge of it, there was not a lot of uh, oversight at times. And, um, and I'm grateful for it. It's not like I hold on to any resentment. We've had conversations at nauseum about that kind of stuff. So we're both all at peace with it. But it taught me that if I wanted to make shit happen, I had to make shit happen. It wasn't just gonna present itself. And so by doing the Marine Corps, one of the things it taught me was that I wanted to prove that I could, you know, when you're a person who's bullied for being short and I, I suppose in the nineties being short and I guess fashionably dressed, you're just automatically a faggot. And can I say faggot? I don't mean it offensively. I'm just yeah. using terms that were used against me. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't mean it offensively to anybody that's watching. I'm just sharing with you. I'm not politically correct at all. So don't worry. And so it was one of these, like, I'll show you motherfucker kind of a situation. And I did successfully the aspect of the combat training and, and, uh, um, and you know, all of my training that I had to go through with boot camp and all that, the physical aspects were easy for me. The mental aspects were more difficult with people yelling in your face because I'm a person who's always been a self-starter and who has always had initiative and a go-getter. So to be in your face, treating you as though you don't have the intelligence to do that was a little frustrating. Now, of course, I do know in, in the aftermath of it that it was a way of breaking you down to build you up. But at that time, that's not how I was looking. I was like, dude, I got this. Like, get the fuck out of my face kind of a thing. But of course, he was six foot one and fucking 200 pounds and I'm five foot four, 115. So I didn't really say much. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a good experience. The thing I say to people a lot that I find uh, hilarious is the one thing that resonated with me after I got out is for years, probably at least two years. And I didn't even realize I did this until it was pointed out by somebody. I still brushed my teeth with my feet at a 45 degree angle for like years after I got out. And somebody's like, why do you stand like that when you brush your teeth? And I was like, Oh, didn't even realize I was doing that. <laughs> and that was one of the weird quirky things that stuck with me, but the experience as a whole was awesome. And it definitely gave me this sense of, I can do anything. I, I don't need anyone to facilitate me having anything I want in this life if I put my mind to it. And, um, and that has served me well as I've gone through my life, even in times of struggle where I could have fallen deep down, um, that characteristic and, and that mindset has served me well from that. So I'm grateful for that as it pertains to the other shit. I was, <laughs> I was actually having a conversation with somebody the other day who was, I was talking about the Marine Corps and they're like, weren't you worried? Weren't you scared? And I'm going to share another thing that makes me feel like, was I the stupidest person on the planet back then? Like I must've been so naive and didn't even realize how all naive I was. <laughs> When I joined the Marine Corps, my mindset was, I want to like pay homage to my grandfathers. Like, oh, you know, they were in the Marine Corps. I'll go in the Marine Corps. And then also just to prove that I could do it. You know, like I said before, being bullied and all those kind of things. It never occurred to me. And I'm so embarrassed to even admit this. It never occurred to me. The training that I was receiving was so that I was combat ready to go to war if that happened to be the case. It did not occur to me till I was in combat training after boot camp. Uh, 
and I was doing this kind of like low crawl under barbed wire with um, my uh, my uh, rifle in my hand with a bayonet on the end, which I was like, a bayonet? What is this, 1872? But I'm crawling under this barbed wire, and then you get up and you have to jab the uh, the foam dummy. And I thought, oh, fuck. This training is so that I know how to kill somebody. Never even occurred to me. And I was like, what the fuck have I got myself into? <laughs> And I'm laughing because I'm like, how could you be so fucking angry? What did you think you were doing? Like pageantry? Like what the fuck? <laughs> I look back on that now and I was saying, I just want to go wake up, stupid. <laughs> Dude, don't beat yourself up. I swear to God, if people weren't so self-conscious, we all have plenty of stories of when we were like younger. <laughs> but I mean, think about it like this. If you were to go out and date an 18 year old right now, how freaking easy would it be to manipulate them? Oh. You could convince them the sky was yellow. <laughs> like, fair just, enough. No, oh, I, well, I'm going to say this though to that. I have met a lot of younger gay men recently who their understanding and grasp on the gay world and more so sexual kinks and other aspects blow my mind. I moved to Fort Lauderdale 12 years ago where I currently live. So 12 years ago, I was 30 and I surprisingly did not even know what the term BB meant. I had no clue it meant bareback and I wasn't stupid. I was having copious amounts of sex at that time. Maybe I just didn't know the verbiage and all that kind of stuff. But I talked to these guys. Now I met an 18 year old who is a fisting bottom recently and a very, very voracious fisting bottom. I mean, you could drive a Mack truck, Mack truck up his ass. And I'm like, how did you get into this? He's like, oh, I kind of thought it was hot since I was 16. I'm like, what? At 16, I was just excited to get a fucking driver's license. Like, I didn't know what any of this shit was. And with the internet, I mean, there was no internet in the fucking, I mean, I guess we had a mild version of it, like with the fucking dial up and shit in the nineties. But it was like, how the fuck did you know this? It blows, it blows my fucking mind. Absolutely blows my mind. And no, I mean, envious. <laughs> think about it though. Like your average 18 year old right now, they can see more dicks or more tits in the course of an hour than you or I could in an entire year at that mm. same age. Yep. When I, when I was in my late teens, my ability to jerk off was to, um, what was that magazine that they would send to your house that I would have to sneak? Um, the Sears catalog? <laughs> was it fucking jerking off to lawn tools? No, the, <laughs> no, the one that was the underwear, International Mail? Dude, Sears catalog had an underwear section. I don't know that I ever got that magazine, but there was international mail. I had to subscribe to it myself and I would have to hide it. So my mom, and it was all like men's underwear, but like see-through shit. And so I think I'd like look and I'd like, if I look just right, I'm going to be able to see through this because of course it's fucking 3D, which it was not just to be clear. And so <laughs> I'd be like, so turned on by these like sexy men's underwear, which incidentally my mom did find under my bed one time. What is this? So that was a fun experience. <laughs> <clears throat> ah, the no, things I don't know though. I, I think we grew up in the right time though. Cause we actually, have the ability to use our imagination and stuff. Fair point. You know what I mean? Because the younger generation now, they're like so desensitized. If at 18, you're already at that point, like... Yeah, where's it going to go, where's oh. it go from there, right? Like, I don't know. It, it's, 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 it's scary, but at the same time, it, it I, I, there's a little envy for it. You know, I mean, I... The access, so so think of it from a standpoint of like when we were in our late teens and coming, come, our coming of age, if you will, you know, for me, I didn't come out until after I got out of the Marine Corps. I was terrified. I knew I was gay. I knew I liked men, um, but I had a girlfriend. We were engaged to be married, which we would have most likely had she not had a miscarriage. She was pregnant with my child when I was in the Marine Corps. And so like, I think about that. I'm like, I would have like, a 23, 24 year old nowadays, which 
would kind of be fun. I'd be like, I would assume I would be like a hot DILF. So that would be kind of cool. But like the idea of having like a college age child blows my fucking mind. But so like these kids nowadays, they're like, they know what they like, but they're also open to other versions of themselves. So like one of the things that was really struggling for me when I was younger was first and foremost, being able to express that I liked men. So I'll give you an example. I remember when I was, I think I was 13, 12 or 13. And I had a girlfriend, she was my parents' friend's daughter. So just by proxy of association, she was my girlfriend. And she invited me to a Halloween party at her house. And her friends were all older. She was, I was not part of this. Like, uh, what, what was that chat thing that people did back in the day? A AIM, the in instant messenger. Yeah. I never really got into that. I was like an outdoor kid. Like I never did computer shit. Um, clearly for our earlier conversation, it was a struggle enough to log on to this. Cause I was like, I don't even know how this fucking works. My computer was dead when I tried to log in. Um, but so she had a lot of older friends and by older, like, you know, 16, 17, probably inappropriate at like 12 and 13, but I digress. And I remember she had this one guy that came and I pulled her aside. And I was like, I think, I think your friend is cute. And she's like, Oh, he gets that a lot. He's not that way. And I was like, what do you mean that way? She's like, Oh, he, he's not into guys. And I remember crying immediately and thinking like something's wrong with me. And so I didn't have any platforms or any, um, outlets or other people that I could talk to because this is going to sound super fucking judgmental and cliche, but back when I was a kid, the only gay people I knew were florists and hairdressers, literally. And I know that sounds like a still, still Magnolia's moment because they did say that in that movie, but that was the truth of my experience. Like mm -hmm. I, and they, they were like super flamboyant hairdressers. And for somebody like myself that didn't identify with that, it was hard for me because I was like, where do I fit in? And so when back to the original question, I see these younger people nowadays and I'm like, I'm envious, but not jealous. And I'm excited and happy for them to have that platform to be able to like, at least start unpeeling the onion of what they are. And it's going to change. I mean, who you are at 18 should theoretically change as you progress and get older, but at least you have that starting point to say like, I like this. Let's see what this looks like. And like something else presents itself. I'm like, oh, maybe I like this. And so when I was first coming out at 18, so the girl that I was engaged to be married to, she, um, she and I had a huge fight one day. <laughs> this is super, this is going to make me sound so fucking old, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, she and I had a huge fight and I went to friends of my, my, friends of mine's house. I don't smoke pot. I never have. It's not really ever. I, I have, but it's not my thing. I don't like what it does to me. It makes me like paranoid or whatever. So they were like, we're going to go get some pot. <laughs> this is gonna make them sound bad too. Can you stay with our kids? <laughs> so I did. Their kids were playing in the room and I was there and I was watching a Tom Cruise movie. I was watching cocktails and I was like, oh, he's so hot, you know, kind of a thing. And so when they got back, they're like, do you want to hang out? And I was like, nope, I have to go run and do a couple things. And I finally had the bravery because I had gotten in the fight with the chick I was with to go to the gay bar. I had driven through the parking lot a billion fucking times, but I was never brave enough to go in because at the time I thought, if I go in here and somebody sees me, like one of my parents' friends see me, of course not thinking like if they see me, that means I see them and they're there too. Didn't understand that at the time, but in hindsight, of course, it's obvious. And so I went to the gay bar for the first time that night. And I remember being nervous because I was like, I don't know how gay people act. As I told you before, they're all flamboyant hairdressers, which pan forward, I'm a hairdresser, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so I remember sitting there and this wonderful old lady that worked there as the door person took me under her wing. She goes, sit by me, I'll take care of you. And I'm very nervous. I think they were playing bingo that night. And mind you, this was in a very small town in a, a rural area of, of uh, Florida. Um, and I, I remember very clearly thinking to myself, like, how do girls flirt with dudes and get drinks? Because I was 18, I didn't have fucking much money. So I was like, why do I do this? And I'll never forget the chair that I was sitting in was like a back and like a slat and a slat and it was backless, like a bar stool. And I remember like 
sticking my butt slightly. I didn't have a fucking butt back then. I was fucking 120 pounds, but I stuck my butt through the crack. Bitch, I had fucking six drinks in front of me within five minutes. I was like, this shit is magic. <laughs> and then I ended up meeting my first boyfriend who was substantially older. I was 18 and maybe 19. No, I was 18. And he was like 32. And we like spent a toured weekend together. The relationship with my then fiance, of course, ended when she found out. I'm rambling a bit, but my point being is, you know, there was not platforms for me to be able to discover those things. So, I mean, I guess in essence, I had to discover it organically, which I guess is cool. And I mean, it worked for me. I mean, it's what my story is. Um, but it would have been nice to be able to know from an earlier age, like, there's other people like me out there. You know, and, and so many people nowadays have that opportunity. How they choose to navigate that, maybe sometimes sus, but, you know, at least it's an option that it wasn't really so much for me. But to your point, they know so much now, like that, that self-discovering phase, looking back, is cool. Like I look back at those times and while there were struggles with it, I, I, I look at it fondly. I'm like, you know, I got to see like, you know, firsthand, it wasn't like, Hey, meet me, da, 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 and I'm texting along, and then they ghost me or whatever, and then I'm just like, oh, I'm ugly. They don't like me, and now I have a low self esteem, you know, that kind of a thing. I don't know. It's every generation says about the generation that preceded them, like you know, like oh, they're so old and archaic. They don't know what they're doing. We have it all figured out. This generation, they'll be like, they'll be old one day too. <laughs> God, no, seriously, like listening to you talk is just bringing back so many memories. Because <laughs> I remember going through that same thing where you would like be like, oh my God, am I this way? So then you'd go to like your shitty dial up internet and you'd like, <laughs> and like, okay, for here's an interesting statistic for those of you watching and for you as well, Archer. In the 90s, the number one cause of divorce was the internet and it wasn't be like the internet today it was because the internet was so fucking slow you'd spend hours on it waiting for like a page to load and shit. <laughs> people weren't spending time with their families because they were just sitting there you know it would take like 45 minutes for like one picture to load I, Jesus. this literally happened to me this morning and i thought about that that exact thing i was getting ready to leave for work and I didn't realize my internet had like glitched or went out or whatever. And so I was trying to look at something on F Facebook cause I'm a hundred years old and I was on Facebook and the thing was spinning and I was like, what the fuck is taking so long. And I was like, Oh shit. Like <laughs> back in dial up days, this still would have been pretty fucking expeditious. <laughs> oh my God. No, that's so <laughs> but I think you're right though. Like, cause a lot of people, I feel like, get hung up on the destination mm -hmm. when really it's about the journey of, you know, self-discovery and all that shit. And, like, one thing, though, that, that you mentioned that I kind of want to go back to because I preach about it all the time on this channel and my monologues and stuff is, like, personal responsibility and discipline and, you know, all that stuff, like, I feel like that's so fucking rare. Where the fuck did it come from with you? Because it sounds like you had it before the Marine Corps. Like, like, where did that inner, like, no, we got to take care of responsibilities first. You know, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Um, I think it was a combination of things. I think that we may not acknowledge statements that our parents make when we're younger or we're like, oh, okay, whatever. But they're there, they're, they're buried, they're planted like seeds in the garden. And when the, for, the soil is fertile, they grow. When you need them, they grow. When you're at a point where you can understand them and they're, um, it, it, it's time to utilize them, they grow. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. You know, I, I have little like idiosms that I hear in my head all the time with my parents. And I remember when I was a kid hearing them like, oh, Jesus, fuck, here we go again, kind of a thing. Um, or conversely, I'll hear them and I'm like, oh my God, I sound like my fucking mother now. Um, 
which is not a bad thing. You know, at, at the time I was just like, oh, you know, you never want to be like your fucking parents. You know, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be different, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is they've had their own life experiences that hopefully some of that wisdom can transfer to you. So I'd like to think that a portion of that came from them. Like one, one of the things that I hold very proud and true about my life and some people may not think that it's a big deal, but for me it is. And I have always been a person, and this isn't a bragging moment. This is something that um, kind of gives an insight of who I am as a person. Like I, I, I take personal accountability and responsibility very seriously. Cause like, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And so when it comes to my like financial situation, I'm very, I'm very serious about Hold it. Hold on one second. <laughs> I, I'm actually writing down what you just said. I love that. Okay. If you stand for what? If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. Dude, I fucking love that. That's got to be. I wish I knew who originally said that. I can't off the top of my head think of it, but it's been something that's been, you know, said for, for many, many years. I can't stake claim to it, but it is definitely something that's been a guiding light in my approach to things. Um, because if you're just flowing through the the world, like a, a loose leaf in the wind, you know, where, where are you going to take root at? Where are you going to say, okay, so this is where I stand with this. I'm willing to grow, learn, understand more deeply and all of that, but you have to start someplace. You have to start with some sort of foundation in life of what you are and aren't willing to tolerate, what you will and won't let people do to you. Because if you're not sure who you are as a person, or at least some small foundation of that, you're going to be all over the fucking place and you're, you're going to have no stability and, and you can't grow if there's no stability. So it's just, it's going to be this endless cycle, I think. Um, and so that's been something I've always been mindful for of, but back to like where I learned some of this stuff, I'll never forget. And at the time it of course meant nothing to me because I was a child, but my father said like, if you can't afford it, then you don't need it. This kind of thing. And something about that and also something about watching my parents. So I lived in a very quintessential, like, you know, father went to work, mother was a stay at home mom. She should have been paid more than he ever was, but I digress. Um, and, you know, we did not need for anything. There was, of course, once like I wanted the new, you know, Z Cavarici jeans in the 90s and shit like that. But one, I was too fucking small to even fit in them. And two, my parents were not spending a hundred something dollars on a pair of fucking jeans. You get Levi's and or actually it was probably more likely Goodwill, to be honest with you. And so I remember thinking to myself, if I want more in life, I'm going to have to achieve that. You know, I can't rely on somebody giving it to me. I, I grew up knowing that like there was a limitation to what you could have. And I didn't believe that to be true. I never have. And I still never will. The proverbial sky is the limit. Whatever I set my boundaries to be is what it's going to be. And so being a child. This is like music to my fucking ears, by the way. <laughs> I just, I, I was very fortunate to have those life experiences and I'm beyond grateful for them. So I knew that if I wanted more in life, I would have to create that which I want. And so with the statement that I said, my father shared with me, like, you know, if you can't afford it, don't, you, you don't need it kind of a thing. That shit resonated with me. And this is an example, not a bragging moment, but I bought my first house when I was 23 years old and I bought it completely by myself. Let's be fucking real. It was not a palace by any stretch of the imagination, but it was mine. And um, I did that by, building my credit. I, I had been in a relationship with this guy and I had gone through like with my first three boyfriends living with them. They were all much older. I was even older. So my first boyfriend was like 13 years older than <laughs> my second boyfriend was five years younger than my parents. So that was kind of fun. And then after that, he was like maybe five years older than me, but I always lived at their houses. And when the last relationship ended, I said, I'm never going to fucking do that again. I will never be a victim of being put out when you no longer want to be in a relationship with me or conversely that I don't want to be with you. I'm not going to be stuck being controlled by your whims. I'm setting the fucking rules for my life. And so I, I said to that ex, I said, you watch, I'll buy a house. He's like, you are fucking 23. You can't buy a house. I was like, <laughs> I'm a fucking Leo challenge accepted. And I bought a fucking house six months after he and I broke up and I, um, I owned that house for two years. I, 
refinanced that house, took the equity out of that house, rented that house out and bought my second house. All of this before the age of 25. And I was like, who's laughing now, motherfucker? And the other thing that like, I, and I also at that time, I had a very strong career with what I do and, and that I have done for 22 years as a hairdresser. Um, I worked really fucking hard. I showed up every fucking day. I did the shit that I didn't want to fucking do, but I had to do because I was fucking 20 nothing years old and who else was going to fucking do it. And I had to do these things, but I was able to build a business and become very successful to the point that when I bought my second house, and again, I, I really want to be clear to people. I'm not saying any of this as being bragging. What I'm saying this as I live my life as an example of anything is possible. So when I say these things, I hope it inspires people to say like, you know what? I can do that too. Whatever the version of that is for you, I can do that too. Because I think so many times people kind of hold back or whatever, because they're like, oh, I don't want to be boastful. It's not about being boastful. It's about claiming the power that you have within to be able to say, I get to set the trajectory of my life. And so in this situation, the trajectory was I wanted to be successful. And at the time, it looked a little different than it looks now, because at that time, there was a materialistic aspect that fortunately I had grown out of. But after buying that second house, I bought myself a Porsche for my 25th birthday. And the the best part of that was not necessarily owning a Porsche because that fucking thing cost me a fortune because it always broke down. But it was my father saying to me, because he drove a kind of rickety ass pickup truck. He's like, hey, do you think I could borrow your car for the weekend? My father and I did not always see eye to eye. And unfortunately in the last five years of his life, he and I didn't even speak. And to have that kind of circumvented version of approval was very powerful for my 25 year old self. And it taught me that like, I literally put my fucking mind to it. I made it happen. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't require other people to help facilitate those things. You know, we have people in our lives that help us to grow and learn and understand and things like that. But it really taught me that anything is possible in life. As long as I put in the work, and the effort to it. And it has served me very well throughout my entire life and continues to do so. And I'm beyond grateful for it. I, yeah. I, if we could just like clone about a million of you and just add you to the gay community, that <laughs> like, it looked like a bunch like, of Oompa Loompas running around. <laughs> No, seriously, though, if you're watching this video and you're one of those people who just, and I, I'm saying this compassionately, but you guys know I'm a bit of a hard ass. If you're one of those people who's constantly like bitching and complaining and, oh, blame God, blame society, blah, 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 blah. rewind the last 15 minutes of this video and watch it again. Like that shit fucking drives me insane when people just want to blame everyone and everything else for their fucking problems it's not my fault like trust me dude i've been there like when you take personal responsibility that's when real growth actually happens because one of two things it's either a that's just the way it is and it's fucked forever or b you can take personal responsibility and change it right like uh God, what the fuck is the name of that book? Um, God, it was the book that's attributed with uh, um, bringing down communism. Mine, uh, uh, mine, no, mm. no, no, it's uh, I'm not sure. But anyways, it was about this Russian soldier who was like thrown into the labor camps in Russia during World War II. And the whole book is about like his journey to like self-reflection and personal responsibility. And it's like, fuck, this motherfucker had Hitler and Stalin to blame for his problems. Right. Like if you're looking for someone to blame, you ain't going to beat that. Right. You know what I mean? And he just went back through his life with a fine tooth comb and was just like wow no actually i could have done all these things differently and it's just like frankly it's it's a breath of fresh air to hear you say that because i'm the exact same way to you like people all the time will be like oh well you don't understand i'm like i don't give a shit the belief that absolutely anything is possible i don't care who what when where why that is as core to my just 
that's who I am. Like, mm. I don't know. I just, I can't thank you enough for sharing that. Like, I, I thank you. I, 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 again, I, I say these things because I hope the, so at, at a specific point in my life, I did this kind of internal self catalyzation of who I wanted to be as a person, how I wanted to show up in the world, how I wanted to present myself, but in an authentic way, not like, Oh, I want the world to see me this way because it's fake. And that's, it's not real, but who am I authentically? And is what I, it are, are the character traits that I portray something that I think would be helpful to people. Like I really, one of my biggest goals in life is I want to be inspiring to people. You know, I've, I've, I've had some very wonderful life experiences. I've had some very, and a great upbringing, but that doesn't mean I wasn't met with challenges throughout my life. And we can get into this later, but just to touch on it. Um, when I moved to Fort Lauderdale 12 years ago with my ex-husband, uh, I was introduced to meth and it literally almost killed me. I almost died. And the challenges that came during that and after um, taught me a, it, it it brought back up who I truly was as a person to the core of my being that had been kind of like lost and um, shadowed by gay culture and the area I lived in and things like that. And it really brought me back to who I was at the center of my being. And <laughs> that, sorry, that experience, <laughs> That experience taught me so much and it gave me this renewed faith that ultimately people are good and they, they deserve to find happiness. And if my story could be an inspiration, sorry, if my story could be an inspiration, then I think that that is a wonderful thing. And I try to share it as frequently as possible and as openly as possible because I think that we have so much negative in the world. It's like, I, I don't have time to hear that. I don't watch the news. I don't invest my time and energy or my psyche into that stuff because it is just this like churning sea of negativity. So my place on this planet is to share a, a story of hope and, and the possibility um, that is out there. Should you, as you said, you know, find that level of accountability and, you know, take charge, say, you know what, this is my life. I get a, a say in how it goes and it may be a struggle, but it is a struggle worth taking and having, if that makes sense. Sorry, no, it does. I didn't get emotional for a second. I just, it no, always, no, no, no. always touches me to be that way, to talk about No, that. I just, and two things. I, I want to talk about the gay community because what you said, but also I want to touch on, um, Oh God, I just had a brain fart. Um, <laughs> Welcome to our 40s. It happens daily. <laughs> every fucking day. Some oh my God. Hour by the hour, every hour. <laughs> God, no, seriously. But like, oh God, no, you're talking about um, meth and uh, gay community and... And how it kind of overshadows you and kind of takes you over or... Oh, no, the news. That's one thing that I swear to God I preach all the time, too, is, like, I'm telling you, when I, like, I use social media a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but the second I unfollowed any political page, any news shit, and now my Instagram feed is nothing but, like, positive, motivational, uplifting shit, baby piglets, puppies, <laughs> kittens, like, the fucking difference is night and day. And like people don't, I feel like they don't understand that. Like if you just listen to negative fucking bullshit all fucking day, what kind of person do you think you're going to be? Of course. So I'll share a funny story with you. That is what brought me to the, like, I don't watch the news thing. When I was in my early 20s, the first house that I bought, I remember very clearly thinking like, I'm an adult now. 
what do adults do? I got home from work. I'm going to sit in this recliner and I'm going to watch the news after I get home from work. That literally is what I thought. And I'm not even joking. I'm dead serious. I bought a leather. Fuck, it wasn't a recliner because I loathe recliners. No offense to those that have recliners. It's just my grandmother had one and I think they're tacky. But it had the ottoman. I sat there every single day when I got home from work to watch the news because that's what adults that I knew in my life did. And I remember this story came through that there was a rice shortage all around the world. There was never going to be rice ever again in the rest of the world. And true to form, I would go to the local, pub, the we, we have Publix where I live at the grocery and not one grain of rice was anywhere on the shelf. And I thought, oh my God, it's true. There's never going to be rice. Two weeks later, it was as if it never happened. So I thought to myself at that time, either the news people were in cahoots with the rice people and they were trying to just meet their bottom line and get back in the black or they didn't know what the fuck they were talking about or fed misinformation and they didn't fact check. I don't know. I don't really give a shit. But what it taught me was that, and I know that seems like a silly factor, especially with all the things that go on nowadays, but it was something that taught me. It's like, I got to the understanding. I, I, I have a very spiritual approach to life and I firmly believe to the core of my being, if there's something that I need to know that is going to benefit my life or that I, I need for growth in my life, it will find its way to me. I don't need to sit there and look at the horrible situations of what is being presented in the world and the news feed and all that kind of stuff. Because like you said, there's so many positive things out there and it's not a, I'm going to bury my head in the sand and be naive to it thing. It's like what you turn your attention to, you become, you turn into. And I believe that's the core of my being. So I'm choosing to turn my attention to the positive things in life because I do believe like a body of water, what you contribute to that is what is going to manifest in that body of water. So if you're shitting in the water all fucking day long, it's going to be a fucking shit puddle. But if you're contributing to like, you know, more water and happy things and flowers and wh whatever else that's not shit, it's going to be a pretty fucking lake that you can sit and look at at sunset. Like that kind of an idea. And yeah, I fucking love that analogy. <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but I was just like, that's going to be like my takeaway from this. Is a shit puddle. <laughs> don't look at the shit lake. <laughs> oh my God. Holy <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So I did find it. It's uh, Alexander Scholson. It's in, it's the Gulag Archipelago. That's okay. the book I was thinking of. I don't know why I just I had a brain fart and it was going to drive me insane. Then my mind was just going to go around. around. <laughs> I get it. I but, get it. But one thing, though, I wanted to talk about with you is like another thing I'm super, super passionate about is the the gay community and this idea that like, Oh, if you have to be gay or if you're gay, then you need to like go to clubs and bars and mm -hmm. do the partying. And like, and it's like, I, I don't know what it's like for you, but like here in Denver, if I were to get on fucking grinder right now, 30% of the profiles would have like PMT and shit. I'm like, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. Like, so what is your story with all that shit? So Fort Lauderdale, it's pretty rampant. And, and again, we can get into it more later uh, if, if you want to, but um, it, yeah, go ahead. Well, so PMP is pretty rampant. I moved to Fort Lauderdale with my ex-husband 12 years ago. Uh, I don't know. I was like 20, I don't know. I was like 12 years ago. And when I first moved here, literally when I first moved here, probably within the first month, I was introduced to sex parties that people did that. Again, naively, I did not even know what meth was. Now, don't think I'm some saint because I was doing blow every fucking weekend when I was in my 20s, you know, where I lived. And not that I'm proud of that, but that just, that's the truth of what happened then. Um, and so I was introduced to that. And especially when you're with people, specifically in my case with my then, my, my now ex-husband, my then husband, I'll take care of you. It'll be okay. I've done this before. Don't worry about it. So you fall into those things. And again, I wasn't no saint. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, my story for, fortunately was start to finish of that introduction. 10 months. I, I woke up one Thursday, 
almost exactly 10 months from the first time I tried it. And I was like, this is not the life that I was meant to lead. And, you know, I went through my process then, but to your main question, it, it's so rampant here. And I have been sober from meth for 12 years and I take a very strong stance of zero tolerance. I don't associate with people. I, I won't have an open conversation to share hope with people assuming the hour is not at a crazy one. I mean, I go to bed at fucking 10 30 and I'm up at five for the gym. So, but unfortunately sometimes people hit me up at 5 AM and they've not yet slept. No judgment, just not my scene. I'm on my way to the gym. Not interested in having a conversation about that right now, but I'm more than happy to have a conversation with somebody because I struggled with that. And I would love to, just sh- to, to, uh, to share my experience and maybe something I say could help them see the light. And I have had conversations where they said, whether or not they actually did, I don't know, but they're like, thank you so much. It made me see things so differently, but it is pretty rampant here. And it makes me sad. It breaks my heart because I think people think, and myself included at that time when I did it, that I'm, I'm doing this thing and it's, it's giving me the freedom to express myself in a way that I can't do it sober. And I, I'm here to tell you from firsthand experience, I proved that to be exactly the opposite and some because who I am now on the aftermath of that is a person who lives my life without guilt, without shame, fully and freely and doing things exponentially more in depth and out there and exploratory than I ever did doing that. I probably fucking stared at a wall drooling myself for the majority of that time. So I I have sympathy and empathy and I feel a, a slight kindredness to people that are going through that. But at the same time, similar to the news, I can't fill my psyche and my head with the craziness that that involves. So I will share a story, but I'm not going to get in depth. If you hit me up and you got a balloon on your profile or you're like, hey, want to blow clouds or all the other stupid idiotisms that people use nowadays, um, I'm going to probably immediately block you. Um, just because I don't, I don't need that in my life. You are, you are what you like surround yourself with that. I'm just not going to surround myself with that. Um, but it breaks my heart. And I actually just had a conversation with somebody just this past week and a friend who I didn't know recreationally did that. You may tell yourself that that recreational aspect may last a little bit of time, but eventually it's going to overtake your life is my opinion. If it doesn't great, to you. but I'm, I would bet the farm that it's going to eventually. And I was having this conversation. He's like, Oh, I stopped doing it because of this. And then about a year and a half later, I, I was feeling like I could do it again. I said, okay, cool. But consider the idea that just like anything else in life, we start rationalizing. You're like, well, I only do it one week in a month. Cool. But you live in an area where I know you have people that come to visit you. So now that one weekend now becomes the next week. And you're like, well, friends are in town. We're going to do it. We're going to have a party, blah, 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 all that dumb bullshit. That now one weekend has turned into two, possibly three or four or five. And what is the exception has now become the norm. And I think that's like a lot of things in life. When you start, we're humans. We rationalize. We want to make things acceptable by our choices, So we're like, well, but this is a separate situation. It's not, it's the same fucking situation. You're you're still making the same choices and the date of the, of the calendar is different is what is the change is what it boils down to, in my opinion. And that might be offensive to people, but I say to something like that, if it offends you, then that is your opportunity to look within and be like, why does that offend me? Do I sense some air of truth with that? And that's why it offends me. Cause if, if it didn't offend you and didn't bother you, then it probably isn't applicable to you. But if it does bother you, there might be some truth to that, that maybe you need some soul searching to look into. And there is help out there. There's hope. There's, there's a future that doesn't include that because you had made mention in the beginning about like, you know, gay culture and going out and things like that. I remember very clearly in my twenties thinking to myself, I had a conversation with somebody who was probably my age now. I don't even fucking know forties, fifties, whatever. And they said like, Oh, we don't ever really go out. And I'm, 20 nothing years old. I'm like, what do you do on the weekends if you don't go out? I could not fucking fathom the idea that people didn't go out on the weekends. What? You don't go out on a Saturday night? You don't go to a bar? You don't get shit faced drunk? What's wrong with you? Don't you have any friends? You know, whatever dumb shit I would have said back then. And 
I now, in the aftermath of now becoming the age of this person, I, I see the value and all that. Do I enjoy going out? Sure. Do I go out occasionally? Sure. To the caliber that I did? Absolutely not. But you know, I give myself carte blanche to let go. I'm a very type A personality. I'm a get shit done person. So once in a while, I like to just full disconnect. That means something very different for very different people. What it means to me is what it fucking means to me. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't owe anybody an explanation. I'm going to do what is right for me, blah, blah, blah. But I, I see now like the value of, for me, my life is about having peace. I, <laughs> my friends make fun of me all the time. Like I'm a big gardener. Like I'm talking full on 80 year old man, fucking straw hat and out there for hours tinkering in my fucking garden. My one friend laughed at me so hard. I was like, dude, guess what? I got new shoes. And he goes, Oh, what'd you get? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, they're aerating shoes. And he's like, what the fuck are aerating shoes? And I'm like, you put them on your feet and then you walk into your grass and it aerates your grass so that it's greener. He's like, who the fuck are you? And I'm like, my grass is green as fuck, motherfucker. <laughs> that shit's fucking catalog green. And he just laughs and he thinks it's so funny. But my, my point is, it's like, you know, I think that at the end of the day, gay culture is you have some people that are still blinded to the ideal that they want to stay young forever and they want to go out forever. And I think we all fall victim to that to one degree or another, however that looks like for us. But we're all individuals at the end of the day. So what works for me might not work for you. Cause certainly like, I know that I was never a person that I could hang for like days on end. Like I was never a circuit party queen. I just couldn't do it. Like the whole like two, three, four day thing. I, I, my, I could not comprehend. I would go out for like one night on like a Saturday night until like early morning Sunday. And I'm like some, a switch in me went, you're done. And it, it would still be that way. Whereas like my ex-husband, he'd be like, what are you talking about? It's only Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We've still got two days. And I'm just like, party on, Wayne. <laughs> I'm sorry, just to make it clear. Every time I'm like laughing hysterically is because I agree with you 100%. I can see myself saying the exact same <laughs> shit. But that, but you're right though. Like I feel like once you get to a certain age, all you crave is money, peace, and stability. Right. Like you're well, just like, I don't know that bullshit. I agree with that only because I, I, I mean, yes, to an extent. Um, I don't. I don't know that I would necessarily crave money because I. So I'm a person who I my the basis and foundation of my life is built on affirmations based off of my spiritual pr principles and beliefs, and so I'm a person that I don't feel I need copious amounts of money. My my affirmation on a situation like that is I always have more than enough money for the needs and wants in life, and I'm never at need. Yeah, that's what I'm referring more to. Money than I can ever need comes into my life as need be and things to that nature and all that kind of stuff. But for me, peace. I want to be calm. I want to have a peaceful resonance in this, in this universe where I, I don't have super high highs and super low lows. And in the last, you know, 10 years, my life has reflected that, which has been really wonderful. And I'm, I'm, beyond grateful, you know, especially people that knew me like <clears throat> in my twenties and all that. I, I would be referred to as like an energizer bunny all the fucking time. And I still have tons of energy, but I use it and I use my powers for good than evil nowadays. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just to be clear, I'm not talking about like just piling up zeros in your bank account for the sake of piling up zeros. I'm just talking about money to the point where you don't have to worry about it. You don't go to the fucking grocery store and think, totally. oh, I need to check my bank account or, you know what I mean? Like that type 100%. of shit. 100%. Um, I totally agree with that. But I'm glad you said that other thing, though, because that's something that, again, I swear to God, it's like talking to my fucking clone. <laughs> like, but no, I always I preach like. Putting 220. So I'll be your mini me. <laughs> And I only know that because I watched one of your previous videos where you said, like, I'm six foot and 220. You were talking to Aaron Trainer, and I was like, oh, this is a big boy. I'm going to jump on that bitch like it's my job. Sorry, I digress. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I just, I like, I believe in living life at like a happy, consistent seven. Just 
no extreme highs, no extreme lows, just happy, always positive, mm-hmm. always optimistic. Cause like, fuck that roller coaster that most people live on. Like, we, yay, we're up here. <sighs> fuck that. And it's exhausting. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Exactly. And it's it just, it's- yeah. And, you know, I lived my life a lot like that. As I, th- I think we all, as we are all, coming of age we are all starting to understand ourselves more deeply then hopefully if we're introspective enough we can be at choice to be like you know what i don't care for that aspect of my personality i don't i don't care for that approach what can i change how can i change how can i evolve how can i learn so i can grow past that and and an evolved person then you know follow suit but follows through, you know, action, uh, you know, uh, it, no, no, I'm not going to remember those saying, but basically like, you know, an idea without action is, uh, I can't think of the term, but basically, and it's like sitting in a rocking chair waiting to fucking get somewhere. You're like, oh, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different. No, bitch, you're in the same spot. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're saying. You're talking about, I've heard a million different variations of it, but I know what you're talking about think will smith said one where it's like yeah you can run in place all day but you ain't going nowhere same fucking concept exactly yeah god no it's um oh I, like i'm very much type a too but i'm curious would you say like if it's totally up to you not influenced by other people are you more introverted or more extroverted <laughs> So I've struggled with that for a lot because I think that we have this identity that we build up at different stages of our lives. Um, so let's take, for example, our, our, um, our signs. I'm a Leo. My birthday is August 2nd. And my whole life I've been told, oh, you're, a, you're such a Leo. You, you read these things. You're like, oh, my God, that's me. Chicken or an egg. Was I always that way? And this just confirms that, that I'm a Leo or was hearing the aspects of a Leo, what helped shape me to be that way. I don't know definitively, but when I started getting to a point in my life where I was a little more introspective about like taking accountability for my responsibility in the situations and my approaches to things, I I struggle with that a lot because I do tend to present as a much more extroverted person. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm very proud of that. I, like I said, I'm a hairdresser, so it has served me well in that business and subsequently doing porn. Um, but when it comes to my home space and it comes to my private life, I probably fall more in line with being identified as an introvert. So for example, I have a beautiful home with my current husband. I've been with my husband for 10 years and we have a beautiful home that was originally built as a very entertaining home. The layout of it is very conducive to that. Do you know how many parties I've ever thrown? Zero. I've been here for 10 years. And the reason for that is, is my home is my peaceful haven. I take time to cultivate my yard and my garden and make my interior space peaceful and calm and visually pleasurable to my liking. So being at home with my cat and my husband, is exponentially more joyful than needing people to fill the space for validation or just that, that external noise. So I gave a lot of thought about this as of late, um, in the last probably year or two about how I would identify with that. Not that I feel the need to like, be like, you know, this is how I identify, but just to understand myself better. And I would label myself as a very introverted extrovert. I am on when the situation calls for it, not inauthentically, but because it is authentically, I'm a jovial person. I'm a very outgoing. I love to talk to people. I'm a happy person. I like to share and talk and all that. But when the time comes that, I almost said my real name, Archer, (laughs) when Archer needs to kind of be like decompress and I need just to kind of remove myself from, from stuff, I become very introverted. I, I, I don't need the external hoopla to feel validated and things like that. So I'm probably, to answer your question, I would consider myself a very introverted extrovert. You know, the situations present themselves of what 
I need. Now, I will say there have been times where the situation presented itself where I needed to be extroverted and I'm just not fucking feeling it. And I pride myself on being a very authentic person. I won't, I can't be fake. Like one of the rules, rules, is that the word I want to use? Mm. One of the character traits that I choose to embody that is so valuable to me is authenticity and honesty. That That means the world to me. I, in 10 years of being my husband, never once, not one fucking time have I ever lied to him. But more so, I don't lie to myself. I'm real and honest with myself. So to backpedal to that, if I'm in a moment where what is expected of me is not how I feel, I'm not going to fake the funk. I'm just not going to. I'm going to say, you know what? This isn't really the scene for me right now. Sometimes work presents a different situation. You know, you have a job to do. You have to do a job. And you sometimes have to present yourself in a way that you want, that you may not feel in that moment. That's not real life. That's doing what you need to do to be successful and create a good product or whatever the case may be. Um, but in the real world of my real life, if I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it. And I will excuse myself from the situation. Like, this has been fun. Thank you so much for the time. The day, the day is winding down for me. I'm going to remove myself. You know, thank you for having me. Bye, con Dios, motherfucker. You know, kind of a thing. By the way, I am catching all your movie references. <laughs> Pouring that out there. A full you night. dropped several of them. <laughs> I, lo I love a fucking good movie reference. On a good day, I will bridesmaid that fuck the fuck fuck out of those movie references all the time. I I just, I love it. Like some of my very close friends, like we cut up all the time with that chat. Yeah. I love it. No, I, I think with my best friend, 20% of our dialogue is movie <laughs> quotes. I fuck, so, I, love I have a friend we'll of- We'll get along just fine. <laughs> I have a friend of mine and we literally have nothing but GIF conversations with one another where we'll send back movie GIFs back and forth. And if you read through them, it actually fucking makes sense because we know what we're fucking picking and choosing. It is hilarious. It's one of my favorite fucking things to do. I love it. <laughs> no, you and I are very similar though. And the reason I ask is it's kind of with one exception, every single person I have interviewed on this series. And this is now like number 50 something. Every single person who is very successful, they're all introverts. Mm. And I I don't know, is it chicken I, or the egg? I think that makes sense though, because I feel like if you're a person who is solely extroverted, you're probably for the most part only seeking external validation. So to my original statement to you early on, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. So you're blowing like a week. Uh, these people want this from me. Oh, wait, just kidding. These people want this from me. And you're all over the fucking place with no basis of a true understanding of who you are. And so when you're more introverted, you're taking that time, that solemn self time to reflect on what it is that I truly want and asking yourself those questions without needing an external voice or validation. You know, like I don't need to fucking blare all your opinions in my mind for me to be able to make a choice that suits the direction I want in my life. No, that's so true. So I'm curious, what, what are your interests and hobbies? Like, you know, what, what do you not show on social media? Like you that's had mentioned so gardening, your cats, like that's what do you do in your free time? I have 120 cats. I'm really a 90 year old woman. No, I, I have one cat. Um, she's, Plenty of fuck enough. Trust me. She's me times fucking 10. Like if I was a cat, I would be her. She's like, I love you. Just kidding. Get the fuck away from me. Um, <laughs> my private non Archer Croft um, hobbies are super low key. I love fucking gardening. I spend an inordinate amount of time, money, and effort on my yard cultivating it. I mean, I literally, I trim topiaries like full on Disney style spiral topiaries. And I'm very proud of them. People are like, Oh, who's your gardener? I was like this motherfucker right here. They're like, you don't garden. I was like, bitch, I got videos motherfucker. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> um, so that to me is a lot of fun. Um, I love, love, love doing that. I go to the gym, um, minimum five days, usually about six days a week. 
Um, so I find a lot of joy in that. There's a lot of cathartic release in that and watching things grow and change and, and stuff like that. Um, oh, here's a new hobby that I've been doing the last few months that I'm very proud of. I am teaching myself French. Um, I started doing Babbel. I, I took French in high school and then I did Rosetta Stone like a decade ago and then it, whatever life happened and I got away from it. And so this year I don't make uh, new year's resolutions because I think that's kind of defeatist a little bit. It's like, I would rather make an intention because I can follow through with an intention. If I make a resolution, that means that something's wrong going on in my life. Like I need to change something, but maybe I just need to add something or tweak something. So I made an intention that I'm going to actually follow through this year. So I did, I have no intention of like any immediate plans of going anywhere French speaking, but I was like, you know what, if not now, then when? And so I decided to follow through with that. And let me see if I can remember this. I was doing this today. Ma uh, français, on sait maman et bésoc, mais j'apprends toujours, which if I'm saying that correctly, should translate at the moment, my French is basic, but every day I learn more. <laughs> um, so I am trying every day. I do it for an hour a day, every day. I, um, I have an hour commute to where I work. And so every morning for an hour, I do my French lessons five days a week. And um, what's interesting is it's starting to I'll hear English words and it'll immediately transfer into French for me. I, I struggle a little bit with irregular verbs and things like that. But either way, that's one of my really current hobbies that I'm very proud of. Like I feel very successful. Like I was sending my husband messages today and it was just off the top of my head in French. And I was like, let me see if I'm actually saying this right. So I screen or I uh, uh, copied and pasted it to the French translator. And I was like, oh shit, that was right. Like in my head, I was like, that's not right. I didn't say that right. And I was like, oh fuck. All right, bitch, you got this fucking shit starting to make sense. So that I'm very proud of. That's one of my newest hobbies that I'm very pleased with. Um, other than that, I, I'm, I'm basic. I'm simple. It's a, it's a simple pleasures in life. Like I love spending time with my husband. I love doing things. He and I are so different in so many ways, but we work. We have such a connection that um, throughout our relationship, one of the things that has always been very clear to me is like the things that I loathe doing, he likes and vice versa. So it's, it's a perfect combination of, of, of teamwork and that yin and yang kind of thing. And we just get each other. So it's just at times, not always it's effortless. And so that's where I spend, uh, try to spend a lot of my time. I get pulled in a lot of different directions because of porn um, with traveling and things like that. But I always look forward to coming back to like my home base and the peaceful sanctuary that is my home. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of that. <clears throat> so, um, one of my last questions for you, I'm curious, how did you get into bodybuilding? Like, did that just come from the Marine Corps or getting uh, bullied or? I, I think it was something that has always resonated with me throughout my life because I was smaller. Um, I, I chuckled because you call it bodybuilding. Like I don't consider myself to even remotely that calendar. I'm like, maybe, you know, um, you know, body sculpting and things to that nature. But I've always been, I, I've always been mindful of my weight. I come from a family that is very short. We're all as I jokingly, but not so jokingly say we're five, four by five, four. And that sadly is the truth of a lot of people in my family, specifically on my dad's side of the family, not so much my mom's. And so from a very young age, I was very mindful of my weight. Um, and so I would always tell myself when I was a kid, like, you don't like these foods, even though I may not have ever even tried them because I was afraid that if I did like them, I would end up being larger and obese and all these kind of things. So I was always very restrictive. And then of course, as a teenager, I never went through that big growth spurt where people like lean out. They go from being like that chubby fucking like 12 year old. And then all of a sudden they're 14 and they're fucking six foot tall on a string bean. That was not my experience or situation. <laughs> um, so I was always very mindful of that throughout my twenties. It was kind of like hit or miss because, you know, I was out discovering myself. I was out, you know, going to bars, drinking and doing blow on the weekends and, you know, just whatever dumb shit I was doing through my twenties, self-discovery and all that kind of stuff. And when I got, um, 
clean off of meth in my um, early 30s, very early 30s, like 30. Um, I noticed a lot of the people that got clean off meth got really fat because I guess there was something to do with like, um, they would all eat a lot of sugar, I guess that would help with cravings and stuff like that. And that wasn't my situation, maybe because I didn't do it very long. I was only, you know, 10 months. So I saw that and it scared the shit out of me. And so from that point on, I started doing things like I started running. And so one of the things like people were like, oh, where are you running to? What are you running away from? I'm like, no, nope, I'm running towards a healthy life. I'm running towards the most amazing version of myself. And so I started running and then I did like a half marathon. That lost its interest because I got older and my knees did too. <laughs> and so, although I did just run half marathon uh, like a couple months ago, I'll do it like once a year and then I regret it. And I'm like, why do I beat myself up this way? But um, that started that journey. And then I realized like to the point of like, I get to say what my life looks like. Well, I get to say what my body looks like. I know we all have our genetic dispositions. I know we all have certain things that we struggle with. Great. But I could start putting in the effort. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't completely be honest about certain aspects of my physique. And one of which, you know, people think my ass is fake all the time. That is real. However, my back is not necessarily real. And what I mean by that is I had lower back lipo about five years ago because I had that proverbial muffin top that no matter what I fucking did, I could not get rid of. So I did have lower back lipo. And I'm very honest about this stuff because... I am a firm believer. One of my other strong stances is um, your secrets. You're only as weak as your secrets. And I try to not have any secrets uh, because people can use secrets against you. If you, if you, okay, okay. If you hold back and you're like, Oh, this, is, if they find out they're going to like all judge me, I don't give a fuck. Judge me. It does not make one fucking iota to me. So I share these things openly because I don't really give a fuck. If you judge me, cool. You know, maybe you should be looking inward if you're wasting that much time worrying about what I'm fucking doing. Um, but so, you know, we all have areas that no matter what we do physically, you ain't getting fucking rid of it. So I had back lipo and everyone's like, your ass is fake. I was like, nope, I just got all my back sucked out. And so now my ass looks rounder <laughs> kind of a thing. But as it pertains to all other aspects of my fitness, I really put in the effort. It, it mattered to me to be in good shape because I have a friend of mine who's um, 60 years old. He might be 61 now, who is in phenomenal shape, like ridiculously good shape. He's not a massive bodybuilder, but he's in fucking great shape. And he said to me a few years ago, he's like, if you can get yourself into your 50s being in really good shape, you're going to coast a lot easier into your 60s. And that matters to me. I want to be alive and I want to be mobile and I want to be jumping and I want to be able to fucking climb a fucking mountain if I want to at 65, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So being that I come from a family that's larger, I knew I had to put in the effort. So I did. And, and I've been fortunate to see the results. Um, so probably most, most diligently in the last five to seven years, but even just in the last probably a year and a half, two years, I've no, I got a new trainer and she's a fucking sadist. And I think she honestly wants to kill me. And she's like, you can do it. I was like, I don't know that the human body is supposed to do this. I think you're lying to me and you want me to die. And so <laughs> we have a good time and we cut up and everything like that. And it's motivating. Um, but that too is the thing for me. It, it all boils down to like, I live my life in a way that I want to show people what is possible. Like, so many people are like, I could never, I couldn't do that. But you can, you just have to want to. If it's not something you want, then don't do it. That's fine. Nobody's putting a gun to your head. But like, if you truly want to put in the time, effort and dedication, anything is possible. It truly is. And I believe that to the core of my being. Agreed a thousand percent. Um, so uh, this is your opportunity for anyone watching who's obviously fallen in love with you at this point. <laughs> Where can they find all of your social media, adult content, all that good shit? So I was so nervous I was going to forget all this stuff because I'm not a massive uh, online presence. In the I state. got it pulled up in case you forget. <laughs> so let's see if I can remember. Okay, so my Twitter is – I changed it. I I changed my Twitter like a couple of years ago because I heard there was going to be a crackdown on anything that said like XXX. So I got paranoid. This was probably like three or four years ago, and I changed it to just at Archercroft. 
Well, somebody snatched up at Archer Croft Triple X. And so a couple things go to that. And it's some random like dead end site. I don't know. But either way, uh, let's see. Twitter is at Archer Croft, A R C H E R C R O F T. Um, my Twitter, I had to restart because they fucking banned it. I was probably in a bikini and they fucking thought it was like lewd and lascivious. So I restarted it. I haven't put much effort into it. But if you want to go follow me on there, there's a few things on there. It is the, uh, the real Archer Croft on Instagram. My OnlyFans is uh, JFF at Archer Croft. I don't have an OnlyFans because they don't allow things like fisting and poppers. And I like those things. So fuck them. Um, yeah, I mean, you can Google it. Shit will pop up at Archer Croft. I think that's all the social medias that I have. Um, if you're into fisting at ACFTL on Aspig. So. <laughs> so, like, for anyone who's considering subscribing to your JFF, how would you describe your content? Because I've got people on here who shoot everything. So, kind of narrow it down by interest or feel. Um, so, one of the things when I got into porn is I love all bodies. Um, I actually identify as pansexual. And I know that's going to probably be like some gay men will be like, oh my God, that's so gross. Cool. I don't give a fuck. Um, unfortunately, all my, not unfortunately, but all my stuff is gay content. So you won't be worried if you go to JFF. Um, it's pretty broad. I film with a lot of different guys. Um, my sole approach is being somebody, I want you to look at it and feel like you're like peeking in the window at me. So a lot of my stuff is like very real. All, and it's all very real. I don't have any, you know, fake shit, stage shit and everything like that. No diss to anybody that does, just not my thing. Um, there's some fisting stuff on there. Not as much as I'd like, because a lot of I get to I got to wrangle that shit in and like just do me. Like I don't film everything because I don't want to deviate from like being able to be real in my interactions with people. So I don't film everything. I'm not one of those people that are like, we have to film everything, set up a camera. No, 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 we're not doing all that. Um, so there's, you know, right all kinds of regular sex with all kinds of people. I honestly, I don't care if you're tall, short, fat, skinny, hairy, fucking smooth. It makes no difference to me. I find something beautiful in every man that I interact with. So there's a large spectrum of that. In some of the early ones, my hair is long. When I first started doing porn, I had long hair. It was like, you know, down to here. It's obviously shorter now. People all the time, I love your long hair. I was like, it's been gone for three years. Sorry, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um, so it's a good broad spectrum, but you know what? Send me a message. If there's something you want to see, maybe I can make something happen. Okay. All right. If it's um, legal. And <laughs> all right. No, I was just going to say, if it's legal. <laughs> that is very true. And uh, for those of you watching, you can find all my content, Instagram, Twitter, all that shit. It's just masculine Jason, one word. Um, but seriously, though, Archer, I cannot... Thank you enough. I am truly beyond impressed just with your mindset, with everything. And thank you. I don't know. It just, it literally felt like I was interviewing myself. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I was, I was very much looking forward to this. I was nervous because I, you never know how things are going to go. And I'm like, am I going to sound like a jackass? Um, but I was like, just be authentic and it'll be what the fuck it'll be. So I appreciate you taking the time to have me on and everything like that, or even just plainly asking me to be on. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to connecting with you later, you know, in July or whatever. Yeah. I'm and, uh, of that dick just so you know, for <laughs> those of you watching, um, Archer and I do have a studio scene set up for July. So you will get to see us together. And, uh, if he ever brings his sexy ass out of Florida and comes to Denver, we can also shoot some fan content. I got so sick there the one time I went. Altitude sickness is real. It fucked me up. Oh, yeah. Fucked me up. Well, I got oxygen, so you'll be fine. <laughs> I'll come pick you up at the airport and I'll bring my oxygen concentrator. You got no nothing to worry about. My cat wants to say hello. What are you saying? Aww. What are you saying, little girl? Say hi. How old is she? Seven. She's an old lady. Oh, wow, she is very talkative. 
Yeah, she's very chatty. I'm not sure she was kitten. I was like, no. normally cats don't meow that much. She's very chatty. Like, she'll let you fucking know real quick. She's like, sorry, now I got fur everywhere now. <laughs> it's like it's like snowing in here with fur because of that. So, sorry, I felt she needed a cameo. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank but, you so much uh, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in July. Yes, no, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And for those of you watching, um, again, it's just Archer Croft and Instagram is the real Archer Croft, right? Correct. So, yeah, um, please go ahead and support him if you did enjoy this interview. And thank you so much for sticking around with us this long. Hope this was entertaining. I, I think Archer was by far one of the best guests I've ever had. <laughs> hey guys, just want to say thank you for watching this video. And if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button. And on the left hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel. There are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that. It is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos the porn star confessions, the Dom sub, all that stuff. It is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.